one, two, one, two, three, four, five, <coughs> six. It's good. Uh, okay. Hello. I'm Laura, and I'm sitting here on stage at the Athenaeum. John LaBelle, one, two, three, four. Okay. Good evening, friends, and welcome to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia on this beautiful evening. It's so wonderful to see so many of you here, to see friends and members and board members and former board members and literary award committee members here for a, a wonderful evening of learning. The Athenaeum of Philadelphia, as you know, is a place where we seek to nurture curiosity and strengthen community. In 2011, an interested neighbor suggested to then Executive Director Dr. Sandra Tatman that in order to grow the membership and support of the Athenaeum, it ought to provide, quote, intellectually stimulating, interesting, enjoyable experiences that are relevant to our world, that connect us to ideas, people, neighborhoods, institutions, and the city of Philadelphia experiences that help us understand how we fit into the cosmos. And that is just what we seek to do in this inspiring place. And those of you who are members know this. If you're not, you're going to and want to be a part of this community. Since 1949, one of the ways that we've been doing this is with the annual literary awards that have been supported by the Charles Wharton Stork Memorial Lecture Program since 1983. For the past several years, the Athenaeum has also had an Art and Architecture Book Award as part of the Literary Award series. 
Daniel Traster, who's here tonight, uh, was long a member of the Art and Architecture Book Award jury, and he had this to say at the presentation of the 2022 Book Award at the annual meeting this past spring. He gave me permission to quote. He said, this year, faced with a number of remarkable books, we could not choose just one, but instead chose two. They are John Lobel's The Philadelphia School and the Future of Architecture, a volume in Rutledge's series Research in Architecture, and from the University of Pennsylvania Press, Laura Wolf Powers' study, University City, History, Race, and Community in the area, Era of the Innovation District. Both books, uh, Daniel went on to say, concern Philadelphia, its built environment, its architectural and urban history, and the influence of its architectural teachers and theoreticians on the city's built fabric. They also suggest some of the relationships between Philadelphia's architectural and urban planning pedagogical history and the city's recent and ongoing redevelopment projects and their impact on national and international practice. Both books, Dan said, well and engagingly written, consider topics central to interests of the Athenaeum and, we hope, to its membership. So we are delighted tonight to welcome Laura Wolf Powers and John Lobel, who will be in conversation with Richardson Dilworth. Laura Wolf Powers is Associate Professor of Urban Policy and Planning city, at the City University of New York Hunter College, where she studies and teaches neighborhood revitalization and urban and regional economic developmental policy and planning, exploring the challenges of planning for community development under conditions of structural social inequity. And John Lobel is professor of architecture at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York, where he teaches architectural history and theory and the social impact of technology and has taught design at all levels, urban design and creativity. And tonight moderating the conversation is Richardson Dilworth, who is a professor of politics and head of the Department of Politics at Drexel University. Dilworth's research and teaching focuses on American urban political development, urban environmental policy, and community economic development. Like the jury, uh, Richard has been able to thread that needle between two books that may seem on the face of it, not to have a lot in common, to uh, help us with what we think will be a very stimulating conversation. I invite you, before we start, to silence your phones and we, uh, uh, Richard will be, be taking conversations from the audience to um, moderate with, uh, with our, our panel after they have finished their conversations. I want to invite you to ask a question at that time and not to give your own <laughs> statement about something, but rather to ask a succinct question that can be answered by one of the members at that time. But at this moment, I invite you to join me in providing a warm Athenaeum welcome to Laura Wolf Powers, John LaBelle, and Richardson Dilworth. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Um, and uh, I'm uh, really excited to talk to Laura and John about their, uh, about their books. So, um, you, you were given the titles of the books, so I'm not going to repeat that. I'm just going to get right into it. Um, and uh, to my mind, uh, these, of course, are two books that do tell uh, a bit of a history put together, um, maybe a little bit of, uh, on somewhat disparate topics, but I think very closely related in a lot of respects, and um, some temporal overlap. Uh, so I, I just want to first start to provide a, an opportunity for both of you to summarize your books um, and the, the main ideas in your books um, briefly, starting, uh, starting with, with John, uh, since his sort of starts earlier. So I was a student at Penn from 1959 to 1966, and that's the Philadelphia School identified by John Rowan in 61 in an article in Progressive Architecture. So when you think of the Philadelphia School, you immediately probably think of Kahn and Venturi. Probably more influential on me was Ed Bacon, who's, I'm sure, controversial, uh, pro and con. I'm a big pro. But what was unique about the Philadelphia School is first, 
It was a confluence of city, profession, and school. Couldn't really do that in New York. The city's so big, how could one school get a grip on it? But Philadelphia is small enough that the three of them could interact. So the head of the city planning commission was director was Ed Bacon. He taught at the school. The chairman of the city planning commission was G. Holmes Perkins. He was the dean of the school. Bacon enlisted young architects to do idealized visions for various parts of the city, <coughs> city center, Delaware Riverfront, uh, Market East, Market West. And those were all people who were just starting their professions in the city and were teaching at the school. So every layer of possible interrelationship between the city, the school, and the profession. Oh, and our faculty members were these young architects who were just building their practices in the city. <coughs> and our student projects were cited in the city. Um, and the city was a laboratory for what we learned about city planning. At the same time, the school was not only architecture, but city planning and landscape architecture. Perkins envisioned them being integrated. It was never going to happen. City planners are ultimately about policy, and architects are ultimately about form. But he tried. So it was a unique kind of integration. And two of the figures, Perkins and Bacon, worked from a really powerful creative vision. When Geddes gave a talk a couple of years ago on what was the Philadelphia School, and I transcribed the talk, it's in, uh, I happen to just put my phone carefully, and uh, I transcribed the talk, and he said, the Philadelphia School was deliberate. When Perkins came, he knew that that's what he wanted to do, he said, if he had gone to Chicago, he would have done it in Chicago. So there was a vision of what they might do, just the way Bacon had a vision. And so I end my book with what this might be of use, what we might learn from it today, and I think acting with that kind of vision. Thank you. Thank you. This <clears throat> um, this uh, good violations of the internal review board there for uh, for for uh, for Pratt um, <laughs> sorry <laughs> but uh, anyway sorry Laura uh, thank you for inviting me um, it's great to be here um, the, so the purpose of my book was to look at Philadelphia redevelopment policy practice and politics at two distinct moments in the city's history. And I think it does have applicability beyond Philadelphia because um, the kind of uh, amazing building that you see going on in University City right now with Skullkill Yards and New City Square is happening in conjunction with uh, university developer partnerships in many parts of the United States. So many, many cities are trying to build innovation districts. Um, but this book was, is specifically about Philadelphia, and the central aim was to understand how, you know, what had changed since the 1950s and 60s when uh, University City transformed dramatically as a result of urban renewal policies, uh, what had changed since then, and what has persisted into the present. Um, so in terms of what's changed, you know, one thing that's changed is that cities are regarded differently in the public imagination at this point. Um, as much as uh, Bacon and Perkins, you know, had these visions for the city, it was also a city in some level of crisis because of the industrialization. And, um, you know, even today, um, the, the city has, you know, about 200,000, 200,000 fewer 
people in it than it did at that time. Um, so the, so uh, there were many leaders who were preoccupied in, in the 50s and 60s with retaining population, with creating new kinds of jobs. And um, now, you know, there's been this kind of renaissance of urbanism and people, cities are desirable places for people to live, they're desirable places to invest, um, and they're exciting and they're vibrant um, it, just in terms of the public conception of, of them. Um, so that's one thing that's changed. Another thing that's changed is that today there's no substantial funding for, federal funding for redevelopment. Um, and so any redevelopment that happens um, needs to uh, have a, a uh, needs to entail a partnership with with the private sector um, and then the other thing that has changed I think is that um, you know today when we think about urban renewal um, at least in the plan in planning programs we, we are a little bit sort of contrite about some of its flaws um, you know we think in terms of maybe it sh maybe we didn't need to bulldoze those those neighborhoods um, in the name of slum clearance, um, and um, and there's um, and there was also the, it was also the case that at that time uh, people who were protesting uh, urban renewal and particularly uh, African American communities who were protesting urban renewal were more or less ignored or written off by the city officials um, and and by university officials and. Um, so that's very different today. Um, you know, we we talk about contextual development. We're not. We don't. There's very little direct displacement that occurs when urban redevelopment happens. It tends to happen, as you, as you see, on sort of parking lots and rail yards and places that are not already uh, occupied by, by homes and businesses. And um, uh, and there's also a, a tremendous emphasis on. Um, social inclusion and on um, participation of communities who are affected by <coughs> redevelopment in you know, making sure that, um, that it's done in a way that's uh, sensitive to their needs. So those are the changes. Um, there are things that are, are kind of, that I've concluded are, are persistent. Um, and some of them are just, just have to do with ideas. Um, you know, then as now, so the, um, the project that I talk about in the first two chapters of the book is the development of the University City Science Center and University City High School. Um, and uh, then as now, there's a very strong belief that um, scientific research taking place within universities um, and germinating in laboratories in those universities can find commercial application in urban space outside those universities and generate economic benefit for the city and its residents. Um, and prosperity and revival. That was true, you know, when uh, Mayor James Tate uh, cut the ribbon on the University City Science Center. It's equally true now with all the development going on and uh, the, with uh, school kill yards and so forth. Um, the second thing that's persisted is that, that the government um, and universities have a role in making that happen and that universities are assets, urban assets that can um, you know, be engines of prosperity, um, you know, because they're educational institutions. Um, and then the third thing that's persisted is really um, something that I, I am somewhat critical of, which is this understanding of the innovation economy as being produced both by and for people who are in the orbit of the universities and really nobody else. Um, so, you know, people who start in positions of uh, wealth and in positions of privilege are the ones who end up uh, benefiting the most from the development of, uh, in a, from innovation development. That was true in the 1950s and 60s. It's true, um, I argue, today. Um, and so, um, you know, you've seen in both cases that um, sort of innovation-led, university-sponsored redevelopment projects have led to exclusion and dispossession. So I, and I explore that um, in part by, uh, through conversations with uh, some of the individuals who lived in those neighborhoods uh, that were destroyed in the 60s from, in the urban renewal project, um, and also people in University City today who are a little bit concerned about 
the impact that all this property value escalation is uh, going to have on, on them and their lives. Thanks a lot. So, um, and, and I, I gave both John and Laura questions that are on this piece of paper ahead of time. Um, they both succeeded in basically answering all of the questions that I have <laughs> for them uh, in, their, in their introductory remarks. But I want to narrow it down just a little bit, and then I'm going to change it up a little bit from the questions just to throw you both off some. But uh, uh, so the, the first one was to, to sort of ask to, to, to try and make it a little bit more of a specific discussion. Um, what you see is the sort of animating role of ideas um, uh, in different periods of, of urban renewal. Why did certain specific ideas um, uh, emerge at certain points in time? Um, you know, uh, uh, and I think uh, the relationship between design, the idea of blight as opposed to some other adjective that could be used. Um, the relatively sharp reversal in terms of our sensibility around urban renewal and blight. Um, but also, I, I want to just pick up on something that John said, I think, that was a little less, um, a, little, uh, a little more understated uh, in Laura's comments, which is the specific context in which those ideas emerged in Philadelphia. Um, uh, you were contrasting sort of the, the capacity of the architecture school to serve as an incubator for ideas and an incubator for design as compared to New York. Um, they're both from New York, incidentally. Um, and uh, uh, but I think, uh, Laura, you were telling a little bit more of a sort of national story um, as reflected in Philadelphia. But of course, it's unique as well. So that, incidentally, was sort of a question about ideas and the sort of specific place of ideas. Could I narrow that question and <laughs> ask Laura? What is the current, can you summarize Florida's ideas about creativity in cities and what is thought of them today? Uh, sure. I mean, John is referring to Richard Florida, whose um, book on the creative class was highly influential in urban policy um, and has been from, for several decades now. Um, I think, you know, his. Uh, it's, it's interesting when a book both describes something and helps to fuel it. And I think that that was the case with uh, the creative class. Um, the, the idea is that um, you know, cities are expensive places. They're, they're tough to live in. Um, and, and so if you want to revitalize them, what you really need to do is attract people who appreciate the Kind of the quirkiness of cities, the the um, you know the the heterogeneity, the diversity, the the sort of um, and 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 he Florida identified those individuals as um, you know people who are involved in the arts and the design professions um, and and so on. As as time went by, um, it was interesting because there was a period when. Uh, you know, every second or third article that you would see in an academic journal on economic development had to do with the creative class. And they were all trying to figure out who was in and who was out of the creative class. And like, we're, you know, we're architects were in for sure in everybody's uh, assessment. But, um, but you know, it, what, what about corporate executives? You know, they, and, and, and critics of this, people who really didn't, you know, thought it was, who thought that it was, um, you know, not a great way of, of thinking about urban development, you know, were said, said, you know, really the creative class are like people with money, <laughs> people with high education and money. And, and, you know, Florida had a point that, you know, in order to, to run a city, you need a tax base. In order to have a tax base, you need to have people with money. So, you know, um, but I'm not sure, I mean, I'm, that, so that is my preliminary answer to your question. How do you think Philadelphia fared? in these terms? Uh, I think in the period that you wrote about, uh, not so well. It was still very much a blue collar city, which was um, focused on hanging on to the remainder of its manufacturing base. I mean, of course, there's always 
um, arts and uh, theater and and dance and so on um, in in every era. But um, I think that by Florida's standards, uh, I mean, in fact, I remember that you know he had, he would had these rankings of cities, which really annoyed me. <laughs> but, um, these rankings of cities on uh, you know and Philadelphia never you know scored too high on them. I think that that's you know you really you've really seen that change, and part of the point of the development that's been going on since around 2010, that was mostly been well, Penn, and, Penn is involved as well, but mostly been sponsored by Drexel with these these new developments um, uh, north of Market Street um, and and along Market Street is is that innovators uh, will be attracted by these districts because they're not just office buildings, they're not just boring labs and clean rooms, they're, um, they're live, work, play environments. So they're places where you can, you know, you can get an apartment, you can go out to eat, you can uh, go to a, you know, an experimental theater performance or so on. And, that's, and so you have the, the, the universities actually engaged in sort of generating Neighborhoods, um, and I, you know, I, I think in ter so. I guess if you know, and Florida was, I believe, uh, a fellow at Drexel for a, a year or two. Is that correct? Um, yes. So, what did he think? What did he have to say about um, Philadelphia's progress towards, um, you know, becoming a creative class mecca? Well, uh, um, it's nice that you think that because he was a fellow, he was actually at Drexel at any given moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, he he um, was at Drexel at the point where he was sort of making an inflection away from the creative class to the new urban crisis. So he was beginning to sort of um, <clears throat> have a little bit of a sort of mea culpa kind of uh, kind of moment um, uh, with his with his uh, his more recent books. Um, but I don't I don't want to get John off the hook here. Um, <coughs> talking about uh, ideas and the animating ideas of an earlier era and how they, um, you know, if, 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 can you distill down the, um, the, the sort of animating ideas around the Philadelphia School and how they impacted the built environment within the city? So it was so multi-layered. Um, so first of all, Perkins came from Harvard he had been chair of city planning at Harvard. He was brought in. Penn was still a Beaux-Arts school in 1950, a little bit late to still be in a Beaux-Arts school. And uh, Perkins was brought in. And he had a very orthodox view of modern architecture. But every one of them, Perkins, Bacon, Kahn, Venturi, recognize the thinness of the international style. It just was not only a thin facade, but a lack of cultural, spiritual, and historical depth. And they all then approached it differently. Khan was a deeply spiritual person uh, in his approach to architecture and mind Rome for its incredibly rich forms. Venturi and Denise Scott Brown dug into popular culture. Um, and I credit Denise a lot with that when in Complexity and Contradiction, Venturi, when he talks about pop art, talks about Jasper Johns. Denise Scott Brown talks about Ed Boucher and parking lots, apartment buildings. I collected Ed Boucher's little books when I needed to pay the rent at one point. I brought them all to Strand Bookstore and got $3,000 for <laughs> six little book booklets. But in one of them, it's called Royal Road Test. Took a Buick up to 110 miles an hour on a desolate road, tossed a typewriter out the, out the window and then photographed all the pieces distributed on the highway. So that's what I got from Denise. And when I said that to Denise, that she had this more pop vision of 
view of popular culture. She said, oh yes, but he caught on quickly <laughs> with her charming South African accent. But I was uh, always saw Philadelphia's issues and problems in these creative cultural terms. Incredible jazz scene. So Ornette Coleman, Miles, everybody in the clubs in Philadelphia. A lot of them were banned from New York by the um, um, what was it, cabaret law. Mm. They didn't have a cabaret license because they'd been busted for marijuana. Uh, they couldn't play in New York. They could play in Philadelphia. But when my parents, who had spent the war years in Philadelphia, my, my father was the Security Exchange Commission, which was, got relocated to Philadelphia. When they come, they take me to dinner at Bookbinders. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> and Penn Forge, Elliot Cook, how many people have eaten at La Terrasse? Penn fought tooth and nail to, to try to tear that last block down, and Elliot held them, held them off, and created the one real restaurant in the whole city. I mean, one hip restaurant. How hard do you have to fight to prevent there being only one restaurant in your city that's a decent place to eat? Paperback bookstores, the A Street Bookstore in New York, Cody's in San Francisco. Philadelphia didn't have one. So I think that what makes a city is the right urban renewal policies, but also all these other things. Theater, publishers, magazines, books, uh, restaurants, et cetera. So, uh, oh, I, I, I'd like yeah, to say. make yeah. comments about my book, because uh, I thought it was Thank you. where it should have been many years ago. Anyway, we, uh, he really designed this whole neighborhood. So, and then he said that. So Perkins had these very bushy eyebrows, bushy eyebrows. And he'd lean forward and he'd look up. It was very intimidating. So I was about to graduate. And I had an idea that a cultural period has a central organizing idea. And in the Renaissance perspective, painting, Renaissance architecture, all unfolds from a central idea. And a lot of that came from Spengler, the Klein of the West that we read in Perkins' course. So what am I going to do, study philosophy? One course will be in aesthetics, but the rest will be in stuff I'm not interested in. So 
Today, there are master's programs where you do your own, do your own thing, but that didn't exist. So I went to Perkins and I figured he's a dean. Where I told him my idea and I said, where might I study this? He said, you seem to have a clear idea of what you want to do. Go home to New York, write your thesis, mail it to me, and I'll give you a master's degree. <laughs> and then when I told that... that What were your years at Penn? What year were we? Same, almost the same as me. Almost the same as me. Yeah, so he, but, but, but Perkins really, was a school really used the city as a laboratory. So Society Hill, we studied the agencies under which it took place, state and federal. We looked at the old architecture, visited people who were doing the molding and renewing their houses studied the IMP competition with Zeckendorf and how he did that, uh, how Pei and Zeckendorf won the competition, doing his townhouses and towers. Um, yeah, every aspect of it, uh, including visiting the sites and et cetera. So um, I'm, I'm happy if, if other people have questions to open up to questions even at, at this point. Um, I have been told that I need to repeat the question when people have a question for the purposes of the camera back there and the microphone. I have no idea how to repeat what happened here, but uh, <laughs> I'll just, so uh, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll leave that. But um, do, do any folks right now have um, questions? Before, that they before like we do to... that, I have one for Richard. So <laughs> when we, we were told about this panel, Richardson Dilworth, that ring a bell for anybody? <laughs> I said, wait a minute, he can't still be alive. So tell us about your grandfather and the role he played in making modern Philadelphia. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Never been asked that before. Right? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I, um, uh, you know, I think that I never knew him, uh, 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 because uh, his, my father was his, his youngest, um, his youngest child. So I, or sorry, his old, his his last child. Uh, so I, uh, I, I have an interesting perspective on him in that he was my uh, grandfather, but also. Um, I, I think that the, the, the stories I know about him are, to a certain extent, um, the stories that everyone knows. And the stories that people don't know about him that I know are stories that you don't know for a reason. So I'm not going <laughs> to say those. Uh, but, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, uh, uh, there, uh, I, uh, certainly that was a moment in time when uh, I think that, uh, that certain people had the ability to be uniquely influential given an incredible moment of flux within, within American urban history. I also think that that, that level of the ability to be an individual influencer is probably over exaggerated or exaggerated just just exaggerated um, uh, but certainly in some cities you can see the impact of not having that kind of um, that that kind of leadership leadership structure that comes into the vacuum 
of at what that point was obviously just sort of a, 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 a rel relatively a, a political machine that had just run out of run out of steam, um, and then infusing it with an incredible amount of federal money, and having the kind of intellectual team and the sort of and the sort of it's, I think sort of energized leadership that that was capable of at least steering that in a reasonably productive a reasonably productive direction. Um, so that's an incredibly vague way of me answering your question. Um, and I don't quite know what else to say about it since I, that wasn't, that wasn't, this wasn't on the, this wasn't on the playbill. <laughs> um, uh, so, and, and, but I'm happy to answer any more yeah. questions. So for those that. who don't remember, uh, 1947, um, Bacon, Louis Kahn, Stoneroff organized an exhibit in Gimbel's of, I forget the name of it, but it's Better Philadelphia. Thank you. And it was huge, multi floors, plexiglass layers, films. Imagine if they had today's technology. A third of a million people saw the exhibit. It was written up in publications all across the country. But it began that these people came home from the war and they said, this is not what we fought for. We've got to make a better city here. And then uh, the reform movement with uh, Joseph Clark as mayor and Richardson Dilworth as district attorney uh, won the election, took over started cleaning the place up. Clark went on to be Senator, Dilworth became mayor, and implemented the renewal of Philadelphia of 50 years ago. Now you guys have to do it again. <laughs> I, I will say one thing, and, it, and I think this does get a little bit to um, uh, sort of re reintegrating Laura into the conversation is is that w one thing that always strikes me about these sort of 80 years of post-war uh, po post-war urban history is the really sort of stark reversal of just being okay with tearing down lots of city neighborhoods and just sort of the dismissal of, of certain areas as blight with certainly some level of um, certainly a level of truth there, but then the just absolutely dramatic reversal of a, of a, of a probably a later generation saying this, this was something we just shouldn't have done. And certainly we see this now. I mean, I, we, I, students at Drexel, um, you know, students at Drexel know what the black bottom is and they talk about it, which is amazing because it doesn't exist. Um, it, it always struck me that the World War II experience was somewhat significant in the sense that so many of those people that you mentioned had been in Europe. And I think maybe we're just comfortable with a level of destruction that, that later a later generation simply wasn't comfortable with. Um, you know, uh, as a, 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 just as a, as a sort of generational change, which leads us to a sort of, a, a, you know, a, the next sort of iteration of urban renewal without that level of destruction, which had become not possible. So Laura, what are you teaching your students about the next generation of urban renewal without that destruction? Um, <laughs> can I phone a friend? No. <laughs> <laughs> We've gone uh, totally <laughs> off script. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I can I can say that um, I, I'll, I'll steer a little bit back to my book because I I think that what I uh, the, one of the points of my book is to say that this this current generation of planners um, needs to be aware of history and one of the one of the elements of history that they need to be aware of is is these big visions and these like monumental kind of um, projects, you know, many of which, you know, we, the Philadelphia would not be what it is today without some of the projects that were implemented during that time. Um, and I, but I also, I also try to, I think that there needs to be a, a, a 
an awareness also of a history that had to do with another sort of a phenomenon that occurred around World War II um, and the Great Depression, which was the migration of African Americans from the South to the North. Um, there was a real estate color line, um, so it was only possible that for them to live in very circumscribed areas in substandard housing that they were overcharged for. Um, the color line was uh, enforced both through practices and norms in the real estate industry, and it was enforced through violence when necessary. Um, so when you know you you brought up the Black Bottom, which was the the neighborhood, the African American neighborhood, um, where U City Square is now, but um, it was cleared in order to develop the Science Center, and that was an area. You know when university officials, the West Philadelphia Corporation, um, and I don't know if Bacon was involved or not. I think it might have been slightly after his time, but um, but they they looked at that neighborhood and they saw all the social uh, problems there and the, the, you know, the crime and the unemployment and the uh, poor quality of the housing and they kind of associated all those things with the people and they, they said, you know, we just have to get these people out of here. I mean, that, that's, that's what the archives, um, that's what, when I did research in the archives and thank goodness that the West Philadelphia Corporation actually uh, re preserved their papers, <laughs> which they didn't have to do. but. Um, but that, that, that what I found was that there was just this sense of no matter what, we just have to get rid of that neighborhood because it's blighted, because it's a slum, because it doesn't have the right kind of person in it for, to, to be in the environment of this great university. So I think that is an important history that I don't think it needs to dominate contemporary city planning, um, you know, lest, we, lest it become sort of just a... a uh, less the whole profession of city planning be backward looking rather than forward looking, but I think that it's important for people who are doing redevelopment today to to know that that, that those histories existed and to um, undertake their interventions um, on that basis. And I think that's why that you know there's very little direct displacement that takes place in um, urban policy today. Um, there's a, a plenty of indirect displacement um, that just happens as a result of uh, site, you know, uh, dynamics in the real estate market. And so one thing that I also try to talk with my students about is sort of alternatives for urban land um, in terms of uh, keeping, even when you have a redevelopment uh, that's you know, picking up speed and is very promising, Almost always, the, the 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 flip side of that is going to be somebody's property taxes are going up, um, somebody's um, you know being pressured to sell their home to a speculator, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that urban planners can do a lot more to make sure that people who are around these incredible redevelopment projects have more of an opportunity to stay where they are, um, which sometimes means you know, interventions in the land market, which are not necessarily popular among, um, you know, people who, who believe that the, you know, economy should be allowed to operate kind of um, on its own. But um, so a lot, of, so, you know, one of the things that I uh, am focused on in teaching and in research is to try to figure out mechanisms that enable, say, people in, um, West Philadelphia today, or um, the low, Lower Lancaster Corridor, uh, Belmont, uh, West Palatine, Mantua, um, to um, to actually be able to experience some of the amazing amenities that are being introduced into their immediate surroundings, not least um, high quality public schools. Mm -hmm. Do we have questions? Okay. Sir, yes. Uh, question. As, as you know, there are vast reaches across of North Philadelphia that were that de industrialized decades ago, many decades ago, and frankly have been depopulated. So, even relative to areas in West Philadelphia, what, what if anything, can policymakers be doing to try to stimulate? development in, in some of these areas that have frankly been hollowed out uh, at this point. 
So I, I've been told I have to repeat questions. So I'm just going to repeat that to make sure everyone can hear. Um, you're talking about um, uh, uh, depopulation and um, uh, sort of increased uh, large-scale uh, vacancy and housing deterioration in swaths of North West Philadelphia and elsewhere. And what are policy solutions to that? Um, uh, what are po policy solutions to that? If you, you're the city planner. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> um, well, uh, um, Philadelphia does have a land bank. Um, I think a lot of property um, in North Philadelphia has been uh, acquired by the city for non-payment of taxes. A lot of it is contaminated. Um, there's not, as we've spoken about, a lot, not a lot of money coming for, from the federal government for redevelopment. But I think that um, some that there are since the city does have uh, an inventory or a portfolio now of land in its land bank, it's a great time to do comprehensive planning. Um, and it's a great time to maybe bring in the next Ed Bacon who has a real vision about what could, what could be, um, because it's, it's clear that, the, that those neighborhoods are, I mean, they certainly have people living in them, and, and again, it's important that those people are um, you know, that, they're, you know, they're, that they are able to participate in, in thinking about the future of their neighborhoods and what they want. I mean, the, the thing that's sort of difficult about Philadelphia is that it's the same city physically that it was in 1950, but it has fewer residents and fewer jobs. And so you have this agonizing uh, ritual every year when the city has to balance its budget, you know, and and the, you know there's all that all those streets and all those sewers and all the, you know, all this infrastructure that was uh, it's there for a much larger population. Um, so I, I think that a, that a visionary um, like Bacon and um, you know maybe on, you know con connected with a school um, with an architecture school could could contribute a lot to to. Um, uh, some visions for for what might happen with that portfolio of land, which, as I said, is um, a lot of it is collected in the city's land bank. So we have um, a, a, a question over here, a question here, and then um, a comment. <laughs> okay. Oh, and you. Okay. So wait, so okay. Uh, we'll start in the back and then move our way forward and and migrate over here. Uh, Yep. Well, I, I will repeat the questions when they're when they're asked to me. So, man in the back. Yes, you. Yeah. Okay, the question was about Pratt and Myrtle Avenue. Pratt was located in a decaying neighborhood. <clears throat> there were burned out buildings. There were burned out buildings all around Pratt in the 60s. I would, uh, there were abandoned burned out cars that would be on the street for years at a time across from my building where I teach. Our new president, 25 years ago, said the saving of Pratt requires the saving of the neighborhood. And he started the main commercial drag that was half empty was Myrtle Avenue. He started a Myrtle Avenue um, association to renew it. And both Pratt and Myrtle Avenue has prospered. Now the neighborhood complaint is the housing is too expensive. Um, but the buildings were abandoned and burned out when I was first got there. So the, at Penn, one of our one of the president just I guess in the seventies, Penn became very focused on the the 
what would be the right word, renewal of the neighborhood around it, not tearing it down, but assuring its prosperity. How well that's done is beyond my, again, Laura might know better. Well, are you, are you talking about the West Philadelphia Initiative? Okay, and it was... That, that was more in the like, early, late 90s, early 2000s. But, I mean, Penn, like, Penn was very involved in the drawing of the urban renewal districts um, around its campus. Some of, and the, many of those urban renewal projects were uh, implemented, and some of them were not, because, partly because federal funding started to run out. Uh, and so it was actually really fortunate for the institution um, when Judith Roden became president in the 1990s that there were actually some, some vacant sites that it was able to revitalize. And it, you know, there wasn't any issue of sort of displacement because the sites were already vacant or there were parking lots or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you know, Penn has, has really um, been a major figure in the, the, the fate of West Philadelphia neighborhoods over the past, and probably you know, many people here may be able to tell me more than I know about this, but um, yeah, they, they, the West Philadelphia initiatives were um, you know, extremely successful, particularly from Penn's point of view, in um, making the area kind of more habitable for um, students and other university-affiliated individuals. Uh, and what's interesting um, is that John Fry, who was at the center of the West Philadelphia initiatives at, when they happened at Penn, is now the president of Drexel. And I think it's clear that, that he br brought many le uh, lessons with him from, from one job to the other. Of course, there's always difficulties. There's a reason why the phrase town and gown, there's always a conflict between the university and its surroundings. You know, it, it, does, it, it does strike me that there's an inflection point in the 1990s, which is a reversal of that famous Moynihan quote of sort of create a great university and wait 200 years for your city to be great. I mean, that, that inflection point in the 1990s was universities had to start concentrating to a greater extent for their survival in a lot of instances on city building around them to build their own environments up, which is certainly a part of the university city initiatives and part of Drexel's current uh, partnership with Brandywine Realty Trust. Um, and we uh, uh, further up, up here, I believe, Bim, you had a question? The, uh, in the middle uh, row? I, no, OK, no questions over here. Sir, do you have a question? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I don't think so. By the way, I'm Dave Trout. Hey, hi. I'm just going to say, I, I came 68 years ago to study Africa. But in, in those 68 years, in the last 10 or 15 years, the city has changed architectural Suddenly, I'm not really aware of it from New York, moved into the neighborhood surrounding which are not people. You, you walk through those neighborhoods and then you no longer recognize the city. I don't recognize the city of I do when I was years ago. Uh, How is it different? That that. This is something that, and, and these changes are, are largely going without criticism. Unfortunately, we no longer have a full-time architectural critic where all of this phenomena is occurring really without comment. Okay. Uh, you can see if you walk through uh, uh, Francisville, where my office is, that the Philadelphia school is completely stopped. Okay. And, it's, and it's principal. So I wonder if you'd like to comment on what I just said. Now that so that was a question on the, um, uh, uh, on, the, on the diminishing impact of the Philadelphia School over yeah. time. Is that? It seems to have been forgotten. And the new residential is replacing the old 
brick row house, Philadelphia, that we know. It's a phenomenon. It's a shocking effect. If you go into these How would you describe? How would you? How would you describe? How would you describe the change? Uh, well, the use of brick as a material is disappearing almost completely. Hopefully, not the brick across the arches. <laughs> no longer see. Uh, you have uh, projecting bays everywhere, covered with metal panels. Okay. Great expanses of glass. Uh, I call it the new vernacular. But again, for New York, uh, for New York, you may not be aware of it. I live in it. We live in it. Let's say it's it, 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 a man in the farm or size. Uh, maybe it's a good thing, you know. Maybe what's happening in Philadelphia is a good thing. Uh, 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 uh. I don't know. I'm kind of old fashioned. You know, I'm the Philadelphia school. But uh, there really is a new architectural working with the developers to really have a new view of what the city should look like. I want to make sure that we get maybe a, just a few more questions, just to just just as we're getting near the seven hour. Are, are there other questions? Yes. So this is just for the this is commenting on the um, the 76ers the, the the idea of moving the 76ers stadium into the I guess fashion district. Um, uh, and I, have I think the city has actually done a remarkable job bringing buildings into it and somehow making them. <laughs> I actually was going to ask you, John, if, if you consider IMK to be part of the Philadelphia School. He's the one who designed Society Hill Towers, right? Yes. Um, I don't know. I guess it's just <laughs> semantic. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that those, um, the Port in place exposed concrete he used, then show up in Gipps Bay Apartments in New York and then NYU Towers in New York. Mm. So, yeah, I guess so. But I also wanted to respond to what you had to say about uh, local activism. Um, the, the, the care that people have for their neighborhoods is uh, it's universal and it, it's, um, Neighborhoods of all types have individuals who have strong attachments to them, um, and sometimes they express that as an attachment to a particular kind of architecture. Sometimes it's more about 
the culture and and um, you know the the community ties and so forth and um, so I think there's always a tension when a development project is proposed uh, that disrupts somebody's community that they're very attached to and often there's uh, because there's a lot of interest um, you know like architecture and real estate development are kind of uh, Dead fellows, you know whether they want to be or not. So if the, if um, you know, when there's a big project or um, and uh, in order to make it happen, there has to be a sufficient uh, return on investment for the for the property investors, and then that sometimes ends up driving the nature of what gets built. Um, so um, I don't really have a view about the. 76ers Stadium, except to say that I know I've seen a lot of um, very spirited activism on the part of people who do not want their neighborhood to be changed. Time. We're at, uh, well, yes, please. Uh, are, are we okay? Thank you so much for thank you for, for coming. coming out. Thank you for thank you to Richardson Dilworth and Laura Wolf Powers and John Lobel, Richard, especially you for trying to corral this very energetic <laughs> crowd, which has lots of opinions to share tonight. Um, thank you for being here. We are selling the books over here, so if you want to buy a book, have it signed, um, add it to your library as you read and study these events uh, uh, and, and, and our city, you can come over here and, and buy a book. There is a reception in honor of our award winners, and I want to let you know a couple of things before you go. I know you all are ready for the food. October is Member Appreciation Month, if you haven't noticed that yet. You can go downstairs if you are a member and put your name on a little raffle ticket for a drawing next week. Every week we're doing drawings to celebrate our members with packages. This week includes tickets to a lot of our art and cultural institutions. Um, next Monday is Member Appreciation um, Member Monday, so come between 5 and 7. Bring a bottle of wine or something to share. Bring a friend who has not been to the Athenaeum this, this time for Member Appreciation Monday. Next Thursday, a group of us go to Harrisburg to tour the Capitol and to attend Preservation PA's award ceremony where the Athenaeum is receiving a stewardship um, a leadership award for the restoration of our exterior. Tomorrow's the last day to buy tickets if you want to join us, so please go online and do that. And October 23rd, uh, Christopher Woods of the Penn Museum will be here to talk about the future of museums in general and Penn Museum in particular. I hope you will sign up and join that event as well as many other events we have. Thank you again to our panel here for their participation this evening. Well, thank you guys. So I'm sorry it didn't go according to you, the way you laid out your questions, but I think it's really lively. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Good to Wish see you. Stay longer on and show you the new Philadelphia. Yeah. I'll come down sometime. Excuse me? I'll come down sometime. You come down. Yeah, I need you to come down. Just 